Okay, everybody, we will get started on lecture 22, only a week and a bit left, um, on melting glaciers. So we've talked a lot about what glaciers are. Hey, guys. Uh, what glaciers are, how they move. And really, for the last part of this quarter, I'd like to concent concentrate on the consequences of uh, these glaciers melting back. Um, so for the rest of this week, we're going to talk about what happens to the water that comes off those floods sort of for the communities nearby. So first of all, in terms of the flooding that could happen, but also in terms of what that means in terms of when that water is coming down, how accessible is that water going to be for the people to use. And then next week, we're really going to concentrate on sea level rise, which is one of our, our big uh, sort of uncertainties going into the future. So today, we're going to think about glacial outburst floods. Uh, which has a very long name uh, for what it is. And we're gonna, uh, it's going to be more audience participation today. I'm not going to let you sit there and just stare at me, um, as you sometimes do. I'm going to get you to give me some suggestions. Okay? So first of all, um, hopefully everyone has seen their midterm two score by now. Um, I think probably a few of you are a little disappointed because the, the overall scores are a little bit lower than the first uh, midterm. And that's pretty normal for this class because what we do in the first part of the quarter is just a little bit easier to grasp, I think, than the second part. Um, if you did a lot worse than you're expecting, then please do make sure that you get your paper back. We'll be handing them back after the class today and probably on Friday as well. Um, and take a look at where you went wrong. Um, a couple of the, the ones that I want to sort of stress as common errors were um, one of the consequences of sea ice melting is not that we're not, we're not going to get a lot of carbon released to the atmosphere as a result of that. I think that was a multiple choice question that caught out a lot of people. We will see a change in albedo. We will see a change for ecosystems. We might see more erosion for coastlines. But we're not going to suddenly release lots of carbon dioxide by uh, melting back sea ice. Um, the, related to sea ice, some people seemed a little uncertain about why there's more in the Arctic. It's not necessarily because it's any colder, but you remember that we have land all the way around the Arctic Ocean, and the currents within the Arctic Ocean keep that ice circulating around in there longer, whereas in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, there's nothing really to stop them drifting north and melting. Also, if you put a stake in a, in a piece of sea ice, what will happen if you come back in six months? Will you find your steak? No, because remember, sea ice is moving. So steaks were something that's quite specific to glaciers. So if you talked about it in terms of measuring the depth, just sort of sticking something through, then you got points. But if you talked about it in terms of waiting for accumulation, remember, that's really specific to glaciers rather uh, than sea ice. So in general, just be really certain that you know the distinctions between the different components because some people seem to get permafrost and sea ice and glaciers confused, um, and we've spent quite a bit of time on each of those. So do make sure that you, you know which uh, is which in terms of the components of the cryosphere. Um, the other one was uh, the glacier sort of moving. Um, but if you look at your notes, you should be able to see that. And I've stolen someone's exam paper to show you the other commonly wrong uh, question, which was the depth of the active layer and you guys can do this. I'm quite cross at you because I know that you can do this. OK? So this person got it wonderfully right. Well done, this person. So you can see that they've drawn the lines up here. OK? So a lot of people drew the active layer at this depth here, where the summer and winter profiles met this sort of this, the, the geothermal gradient. But remember, at this temperature, look, this is set down at sort of minus 6, minus 7 degrees Celsius. So even in the summer, say here, it's still minus 4 degrees Celsius. It'll be cold. OK, it'll be frozen. So really, it's where this summer profile crosses 0. OK, because in the summer, that means that above this, the soil will be above freezing. It will be active. Below 0 degrees Celsius in the summer, this soil will remain frozen, so it's still permafrost. OK? So make sure that you uh, take the opportunity with your TAs this week in discussion to go over any uh, questions that you are confused about. OK. Does anyone have any other questions for me about the midterm? Anything you'd like me to go through? No? Nope. OK. So let's go back to glaciers. So 
This is sort of a bit of a review at the beginning. As a reminder, we are seeing warmer temperatures. Unsurprisingly, as a consequence of that, we are seeing a reduction in ice worldwide, especially in our uh, glaciers. Um, and that is going to continue. So in all parts of the world now, we are losing ice uh, on average from our glaciers. That's especially strong around places like Alaska in the US um, and in Patagonia in South America. Um, and if we look worldwide, there are a few advancing glaciers, but really the vast majority are retreating. Okay, their, their terminus is moving back up the slope. And in the future, as our temperatures continue to rise, unsurprisingly, we will continue to melt away the ice. And really, how much melting will occur will depend on how much extra CO2 we put in the atmosphere and how much extra warming that results in. Okay? And so really being able to predict what will happen by the end of the century, again, relies on us understanding what we as humans are going to do, not necessarily how the system is going to respond to that. Um, so specifically in low latitude areas, so nearer the equator, so low latitude but high altitude, um, things like the, the Himalayas and around the Andes, we will be losing quite significant amounts of ice. And in terms of where that ice affects people, those are the areas where a lot of people rely on drinking water and also where we have people living up in the mountains who might be at risk from flooding events as well as we'll see later today. So. Problems created by melting glaciers. Well, first of all, we just have a lot of extra water. It has to go somewhere. And so we can get flooding, first of all, just from the amount of meltwater coming off the glacier, especially if it collects in a lake and then catastrophically drains, which is what we'll look at today. Also, just as a result, if we're getting less precipitation as snow, more of it's coming down as ice, uh, as, sorry, rain rather, and so more of it is going straight into the rivers. So for example, if you have a wet season and a dry season, in the wet season, if some of that precipitation fell as snow usually, then it gets saved for the drier parts of the year. If that's not necessarily happening, if that precipitation now is rain, it gets channeled straight into the rivers. So first of all, you're not going to get it in the summer months or the drier months, but also there's a lot more water coming down at once. And so we are seeing increased risk of floods. And then as a corresponding consequence of that, a decrease in water supply sometimes in the drier uh, months. So let's look at number one and we'll deal with number two on Friday. So if we think about our meltwater coming off our glaciers, much of it does just go straight into streams and rivers. And really, this isn't the big cause of our, our sort of catastrophic flood events. But that water is really important because it travels down through those rivers, even to people that have never seen snow before in their lives, like you guys, some of you guys. And so, but it affects us because it affects uh, irrigation, perhaps. A lot of the, the water around here is, is brought from uh, sort of the mountain regions in the southwest. Hydroelectric power, in a lot of these places, this is a really obvious way of generating electricity in some quite remote areas of the world. Um, they can use that so power of the water coming past to turn turbines and generate electricity. That's true also in our mountain regions here in, in the US. Um, and also just is it used for drinking water um, by the people. So that water is really important. Um, a lot of people depend on it, and a lot of infrastructure is therefore built around our rivers. But the problem occurs when that meltwater doesn't necessarily go straight into streams and down uh, to where people can use it. We also can develop lakes. And the problem with these lakes is that they are not usually stable. And we're not talking about sort of every other year they sort of break free and we get massive floods. But in geological timescales, sort of on decades or a bit longer, they are not stable. And so they present quite serious hazards to the people that live nearby. So we can get different types of lakes. Uh, we can get what we call supraglacial lakes, which are just lakes that sit on top of the ice. So for example, my bottom left photo there shows a supraglacial lake. They're usually that beautiful blue color. And we saw lots of examples of that when we talked about melting Greenland, how those beautiful lakes collected on the surface. We also get our proglacial lakes, which are in front of our ice. Okay? And what is holding back this proglacial lake right here? What's the name for it? Yeah. 
Moraine, absolutely. Do you remember our moraine um, that gets dumped at the furthest position that the glacier advances to? Um, and so when we're retreating back from that, it falls, forms this nice wall, this nice dam that prevents a lot of that meltwater from escaping. And these are the really dangerous ones that we often find. Okay, so these are proglacial lakes. So we also have cases where ice itself isn't necessarily permeable. We can't get water flowing through ice. So in some cases, ice itself can act to dam a stream or prevent water flowing where it should. Um, so here's a nice example we'll talk about later today. But you can see my blue here is my glacier. And if it suddenly advances or surges, you can see that it blocks where that stream, that thin blue line, would normally run. And therefore, you can build up a lake behind that. Um, and again, at a certain critical point, that water pressure will be stronger than the ice um, holding it back. And so it can burst and release that water all in one go. So why do we care about this? Well, these floods are sort of episodic. So every now and again, we can get floods from these things. And the size of the flood will depend on, first of all, how big the lake is, also how frequently it drains. So if you have a flood that happens every 100 years or something, it's going to be very much larger than one that happens every 10 years, perhaps, um, and probably more damaging to the people. Um, they occur in pretty high latitude places like Alaska, but also those low latitude but really high places like Peru. Um, so hopefully everyone has their map with them today. We'll have a look at a couple of examples. Um, and they do cause loss of life um, and agricultural land, livestock, infrastructure, all of those things that we would quite like to keep. So first, I click a question of the day. Here is a lovely satellite image of a mountain range. And I want you to take a look and see how many potentially dangerous pro-glacial glacial lakes you can see on this image. So spend a bit of time having a look. They're not always the same color. OK, any last answers? Right, let's see how good you are at counting. Fairly good. I think it's probably a bit difficult from the back, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. There's actually a lot, OK? <laughs> it's very scientific. So the easiest way to spot them, what's the easiest way to try and work out where your lakes should be? They're at the end of the ice, right? So if we follow this one down, this is probably a lot of water here, but there's definitely a lake down here. If you follow this one, there's a lake here. Follow this one, there's a gigantic lake here. If you follow this one down, there's a lake at the end here. If you follow this one down, there's a tiny lake here, there's a lake here. On this side, there's a lake here, there's a lake here. Um, a couple of others, there's a lake here, there's a lake here. So there are a lot. And so it's just one of those things that wherever we have melting glaciers, we tend to have water collecting. Okay? And some of those will be more dangerous than others for reasons we'll come on to. So given that we have been increasing our temperatures and we have been uh, melting more of our ice, then we have been building up more water. And so unsurprisingly, we have been seeing more of these glacier lake outburst floods when they suddenly release their water in quite a catastrophic way. Um, and some of this may be due to the fact that we have more population in a lot of these areas now, and so we're better able to record them. But also, just in the last sort of 20, 30 years, we can see that we've been gradually increasing these. And so it is something that specifically countries around these big mountain regions have to take into account, especially if you're building a new multi-million dollar hydroelectric plant, you don't want to have to be rebuilding that again the following year if one of these floods comes down. But some of these countries aren't particularly wealthy. Um, and then here is a word that I can't say because it is Icelandic, and Icelandic is a horrible language. Um, and so uh, we get this sort of special type of glacial lakes that we might not necessarily have thought about. But where we have volcanic activity and ice together, then we can generate enormous, enormous amounts of meltwater really, really fast. 
And one of the best places in the world to see this in action is Iceland, where we have these amazing ice caps, we have these amazing gla uh, glaciers, but it's also a really active volcanic place. It's on top of a hot spot for those of you that were in my ESS1 class or have taken geology recently. Um, and so there's a lot of volcanic activity going on. And so you can see my picture on the left here shows a volcano erupting underneath this sort of enormous thickness of ice. You can see the ash collecting on the surface, and a lot of that uh, ice is turning into steam. And on the, the right-hand side here, you can see what was left of that lovely bridge after one of these big, um, sort of big flood events came through. And I have a little video to show you, and unfortunately, with a relatively little vegetation in Iceland, it's sometimes difficult to get a sense of the scale of these things. But this is the flood that resulted from the volcanoes, whose name I can't say, Ayaf, Yala, Yokol, or whatever, in 2010. Um, and look at the amount of water. All of a sudden, it broke through the ice that was retaining it, and it's coming straight down the mountainsides here. Um, and that water, you can tell it's been in contact with the volcanic uh, material because actually the water gets sort of slightly warm as well. Um, and these things are enormous and they can move enormous amounts of sediment and very large pieces of rock. Um, and so often Iceland has to rebuild bits of bridges um, when these things happen. But they're very, very spectacular. Wish we could get a helicopter there for scale. Okay. So, first audience participation point of today, okay? So, I want you to come up with, with your neighbours, at least two or three reasons why this moraine dam could suddenly fail. What could happen that would suddenly cause it to, to sort of break open and uh, release all its water down into the valley, okay? So, I'll give you one minute to think of two or three very good reasons why that might happen. This is in Peru, if that helps. Okay, does anyone have a, a good reason for me? So why might this marine dam fail? Yes. Absolutely. If we just fill the lake too much, it may sort of push that sediment away. It could cause that, that dam to fail. Absolutely. So just too much pressure behind from too much water there could just cause it to fail. Does anyone have any other reasons why it might fail? Yeah. Earthquake. Absolutely. So in Peru, especially around a lot of these these big mountain areas, they're often tectonically active, and so big earthquakes could shake that loose sediment and cause it to fail. What else? Yeah. Meteor impact? Meteor impact, it would definitely create uh, something, <laughs> but they're, they're probably too rare, I think. But definitely we would be in trouble if that happened, yes. Anything else? Look up. So everyone's doing this, absolutely, this, okay. So yeah, things falling into the lake, right? And what have we got that could fall into the lake? Ice. ice, absolutely. If we're melting bits of that ice, look at how steep that glacier is. We could easily get blocks of ice falling in. And what that does is it creates a sort of a wave that travels towards that moraine dam. And what it can do is it can overtop it in some places. And once it's overtopped and once there's a little channel through, then, of course, more and more water will flow through and it will deepen that channel and eventually it will just all go. What else could fall in? Yes. Rocks, absolutely. You can see how steep that little cirque is. Do you remember we, we say that our glacial valleys are really steep and so, again, they're really unstable. Um, and so all of those things, so good work. I think you've got all of mine, absolutely. So simply overfilling it, so pressure from behind, uh, we have seismic activity, landslides from surrounding slopes, or um, ice blocks or avalanches uh, falling into that. Absolutely, good work, guys. It's a good sign. Okay. So it's all very well to think about this in the abstract way, but let's look at some examples. So I have one example from Alaska, one from Nepal, and one from Peru. So this is a really beautiful glacier, the Meldenhall Glacier, um, and it's near Juneau, which is the, the state capital of Alaska. Has anyone been to this? Has anyone seen it? Yeah, a couple. Okay. So it's sort of, uh, its end is in this big lake. This isn't the ocean here. This is actually a very large lake. Okay. 
Um, and so uh, this glacier is about 12 miles from Juneau. Um, and we had a really big flood that occurred from this in July of 2011. Um, and we also had a similar flood that occurred in 2012. And so really what the residents would quite like to know is, should we expect further floods? And will they be about the same size or um, will they be significantly bigger? And so scientists have been off and investigated this one. Okay, so let me use the mouse to show us where we are. So that image I just showed you is basically looking towards the glacier, looking across the lake towards the glacier. This is the Meldenhall Glacier, and this is Juneau down here. You can see the airport. Okay. And so what we'd like to know is, will there be further floods that raise the level of this lake and uh, pour down this river, um, which might affect local populations? And in particular, it isn't actually this lake itself that's the problem. Um, that lake is pretty stable, and it's not really anything to do with this part of the glacier that's a problem. What we're actually looking at here is this, which was a tributary, it still technically is a tributary glacier, flowing into the main valley here. And what's happened is you can see that there's been retreat of this little tributary valley. There's just sort of a block of ice sat down here. And so all of the meltwater has been coming down here and has collected underneath here. Okay, so here's where that sort of, here's upstream, here is where that tributary glacier is and water has been running down here and it's been collecting under this ice. And here's the main valley glacier down at the base here running away. And so what happens is that that water collects down here and then it's dammed by this big main glacier that runs down. And so that water has been building up and building up and building up. And eventually there's so much water there then it can force its way underneath the main glacier and then it flows out and gets released into the lake further down. Does that make sense? Yeah? Great. Okay, so this is what happened. We released 37 million cubic uh, meters of water. It raised that lake level by 5.5 feet, which is over my head, I'm really short. Um, and then uh, the river that flowed out of that lake also got much stronger. And you can see the uh, rather foolish people stood on the bridge there. I do not ever recommend standing on a bridge like this in full flood conditions. But you never know what's being carried down with the water. Um, trees and things can, can do nasty stuff. Um, and so the nice thing about this is it caused relatively little damage and certainly no loss of life. Okay. And that's because it occurred in quite a nice open area. People weren't or were aware that the, of the possibility that this river could flood. It didn't flood an enormous amount. It wasn't a really high flood. And so uh, we could cope with it. Okay. So my question is, having heard a little bit about why this flood happened and so subsequently why the flood the next year happened, if you were employed as a glaciologist by the people of Juno to tell them what was going to happen, what would be the best thing to tell them? Okay, So think about why it happened. Think about why it was released, that water was released. What would that mean about potential future floods? OK, any more answers? Right, let's take a look. See if you have a future as a glaciologist. Uh, I don't know. If someone put that they would be about the same size, why did you put that they would be about the same size? No one is being brave enough to tell me. You were right if you put that they would be the same size. So tell me why you were right. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to scare people, I see. So thinking about what happened, are we really going to be able to build up a thousand times more water without that being released? So remember that the trigger for this flood was just that we built up enough water that it could make its way underneath the glacier and be released. So realistically, we're never going to build up a thousand times because once we hit a certain threshold of pressure, that water will be released. Does that make sense? Yes? Change your mind a bit now? OK. So definitely it's something to be aware of. But really, from this particular configuration 
of uh, meltwater and glaciers, then really we're probably not going to get significantly larger um, floods because of the way that it forms. Is everyone with me? OK. A bit more training to be glaciologists then. So now let's look at the Langmosh Valley in Nepal. OK. So for those of you who remember you have your maps, Nepal is uh, towards the top of India. Um, it's one of the, the Himalayan countries, so it's a very high country. Um, and this particular flood happened from this glacial lake. So you can see the glacier towards the back of the image there and the amount of water that has collected in these amazing moraine walls. You can see the lateral moraines there at the sides. And also the people here have stood on the moraine at the front. So you get a, a sense of scale for this. It's really very, very big. Um, and so what happened was, in 1985, so a long time ago, probably before you were born for much of you, um, there was a big flood that occurred in August. Um, and this one was because we had a big rock fall from that area behind. Okay? So it came down the, the, the valley and it sort of flood moved into the lake. And that pushed a big wave towards that moraine dam at the end. Um, and it, it was so big that it forced its way through um, and you can see that the, uh, the position of the former sort of moraine wall was up here. After the flood, this was the new sort of position of the land surface. Okay, so it had a really big effect on uh, this particular lake. And so this was a much bigger flood. Um, we had a wave five meters high, which is at least sort of three of me stood on top of each other. Okay. Um, and that sort of flowed sort of, and we had 2,000 meters cubed per second coming down, which is an enormous amount of water. Um, and in the valleys, when it gets focused, that turned into sort of like a 10, 15 meter um, surge of water. And so you can see the scar left behind in the landscape as that water moved downhill. Okay, you can see the scar left behind by that water as it moved down. Um, and so what are the consequences of that? We were really lucky because this is actually one of the main trails up to Mount Everest for the people that are going climbing. And it would just happen to be that during that sort of August time frame, it was the monsoon rains and people don't usually use that trail. So there were only four or five deaths, um, but they could have easily been hundreds. Um, all of the 14 bridges downstream for 42 kilometers were destroyed and had to be rebuilt. And so villages were cut off for quite some time. Um, a lot of houses and agricultural land were lost. Um, also, the fact that we had all of this water moving down erodes the sides of the, the mountains and that makes the slopes much more unstable and so in subsequent years we get a lot more landslides as well. So that also is something um, that uh, we have to deal with. And more importantly, and why this became um, a significant event was that it destroyed a lovely new hydroelectric plant that was basically just finished and it cost $4 million, which was a big deal for Nepal in 1985. Um, and so this was sort of the first thing that really got uh, Nepal and other uh, countries around here to pay attention and to really think about the, the hazards as a result of these lakes and to think about trying to, to monitor them more carefully. And it's all very well hearing this, um, but I actually found a really cool blog written by um, someone who was present in a town where one of these happened, I think just last year or 2012. Um, and they have a really nice account of what happened. And in particular, this is our village and this is the glacial lake that gave way. And it shows um, some of the effects on the village. Um, and in particular, it shows the event itself. And look at these enormous, these are basically blocks of rock. Um, and you can see what this is doing to their nice sort of uh, fields that they had carved out. Um, and also a number of the, the buildings were also uh, destroyed. Um, so these are really big events and they are quite devastating for the towns that get caught in the way. Okay. And then my last example is again a name I can't say and I'm very sorry for all the Spanish people, uh, Spanish speaking people in the room because I'm going to butcher this. But it's something like Juarez? Is that right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, and so Peru has actually been one of the worst hit countries by these floods. Maybe 25,000 people have been killed by floods um, in this way since sort of 1941 or so. And so they really do lead the world in identifying these countries and dealing with the consequences of these events. Okay? 
And certainly since the 1950s, we've seen the number of lakes that they have to deal with and monitor rise from something like 200 to 400. So it's a big deal. And in particular, Juarez, um, which is where the star is here. Remember, we're in South America now, in the Andes, um, is a big deal. Okay. Um, and this is the lake that was the, the culprit. This is uh, Lake Pal Palcacocha. Again, not very good at that. Um, and this was our origin. And so what happened is you can see again how the, that glacier is sat above the lake. And we had a block of ice um, that sort of broke off and, and uh, moved into the lake. And it caused a flood. And it broke through the terminal moraine. And it basically flattened this village. It killed more or less all the residents. I think there's a, maybe a few tens of people survived. But it killed the rest of the 5,000 people there. Um, it was a huge... A sort of 15 meter high sort of wave of water and rock carry a lot of rock with these uh, floods as well and it just took four minutes to come down from the lake to the the town um, and so it, it was a devastating event and it really sort of spurred a lot of monitoring again so why do we not like these big floods it's because of these consequences because first of all it can kill people all of the rest of the stuff is sort of relatively minor to the fact that we can kill people this way. And so we need to be aware of this. Um, then it's things like damage to infrastructure, roads, um, hydroelectric power, uh, towns themselves, um, especially in not particularly wealthy countries. We get increased landslides. We get loss of agricultural land, loss of forests. Um, and also just the amount of sediment that we end up putting into the rivers can affect other hydroelectric uh, plants further down because the sediment basically grinds away at the, the turbines and they have to be replaced. So they're all pretty significant economic consequences for the countries in general. But the idea is, is if we know that they're there, we should be able to plan for them, right? We should be able to come up with some way of reducing the hazard to people um, and reducing the economic costs of this. So natural hazards are predictable. They follow basic laws of physics and chemistry and everything else. And so if we can understand them and understand what their frequency and magnitude has been in the past, then we should be able to predict um, what might happen in the future and try and minimize the consequences of this. And we call this mitigation. Mitigation is any action that we take to try and reduce the effects of a natural hazard. So it's just something we're going to talk about again for sea level rise is mitigation. How can we try and adapt and reduce the hazard? So the question is, what can we do to try and reduce the effect of glacial outburst floods? OK. So if you were in charge of sort of understanding what the hazard was, what would you want to know? If we said you are in charge of stopping all deaths from glacial outburst floods in this region, what would you want to know? <laughs> OK, talk to your neighbors for one minute. Come up with a list of things that you would need to know or want to know if you were going to stop, stop any deaths. OK, so what's the most obvious thing you would need to know if you were to stop deaths? Sorry? Rates of melt, perhaps? Even before that, though. Volcanic activity might be a good one, especially in Iceland. Sort of, where are there volcanoes? Even more obvious than that. Sasha. <laughs> where they are. That would be a good start, right? So yes, where they are. Also, how many they are, how big they are. OK, so we're not doing too advanced stuff here. We're just saying sort of where they are, how big they are, how stable they are. So now we're talking about things like volcanic activity, earthquake activity. Are there big steep slopes? Are there big overhanging areas of ice that might cause there to be difficulties? How thick, how stable is that marine dam? Is it a humongous pile of rock that's probably not going anywhere? Or is it a relatively small pile of rock that could actually be shaken apart or overwhelmed by a wave? Okay. Um, and these factors aren't necessarily constant, especially how big these are. Because as you said, things like melting rates will affect um, how big those lakes are and how uh, sort of much volume there is. And so there's a lovely little video here, which I'm not going to show you all of, um, but it's very overly dramatic. And it basically sort of shows one of the, um, 
lakes that they're most worried about in Nepal. And it shows some of the effort that people have to go to to get there. It looks pretty miserable trekking through some of these places. Okay, we find the lake itself. Okay, so here they've arrived at the lake. What can you see that might not be good for the lake? Can you see those overhanging pieces of ice? So there's one up here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one up here. I would not want to build downstream of this lake, shall we say, okay? Um, and so you can sort of see a bit more of the, the lake if you watch this video and you can see this is where the glacier comes in and a bit further along. Mostly him talking, but anyway. So here's our moraine dam, and you can see that there's all, that lake is already really close to being able to go through the top of this. And so they are very concerned about this lake, and so uh, we want to be able to understand how we can deal with that. Okay. So some monitoring of lakes can be done from space, like we did before. We spotted where the lakes were. We could get an idea of how big they are. But certain things like going and being able to spot sort of overhanging areas of ice, um, going and looking at the dam itself, the moraine dam, and working out how solid it is, um, has to really be done in person. And that can be a real challenge in some of these really remote areas. They had to hike for eight days to get to this particular lake. So it can be a bit of a challenge. So we're going to mitigate this hazard. I'm not going to give up on you guys yet. We also need to understand a bit more about how vulnerable the population downstream might be. So what sort of factors will... Uh, sort of vary the effect, how many people we might be able to affect. So what sort of things might affect the vulnerability of downstream people? Yes. Type of housing, yeah, absolutely. Basically, what the land is used for. Are there houses right next to the river or in the path of, of these floods? Absolutely. What else? Yeah. Transportation. Transportation. Are there roads sort of that run alongside? Because obviously, if there's roads that run right along the river, they're much more likely to be people on them that could be um, damaged. And also, the roads themselves could well be swept away. What else? Absolutely, agricultural land. We could see that in a lot of those areas, agricultural land, good agricultural land, is at quite a premium, and it's often the best stuff is at the, the bottom of the valley. So definitely agricultural land as well. What else? Most obvious one. Yeah. How many people live there? Absolutely. So definitely, if there's nobody living there, then we're probably not going to bother monitoring it particularly carefully. But if there are, say, an awful lot of people in the path of one of these floods, then we really want to be much more careful about how we study it and how often we study it. Okay. So definitely, all of these are good things. So first of all, what does, is the train like? Does it get channeled into narrow valleys, which could affect people? Or does it open up into much wider areas, like perhaps the Icelandic one, and spread that water out? What is the land used for? Is it agriculture? Is it just sort of forestry, in which case there would be less people around? How many people live there? Um, and also things like roads, uh, hydroelectric power stations, what sort of infrastructure could be damaged? Okay? And not all of these lakes are dangerous. Okay? Not all of them are dangerous. Not all of them will affect people. But certainly enough of them would that we want to keep an eye on them. Okay. So <coughs> last one of the day, I promise. Um, not the last slide, but the last question I'm going to ask is, what would you do if you happened to suddenly realize that you were downstream of one of these big um, uh, glacial outburst floods of lakes? What could you do? What could you do to try and prevent the hazard or reduce the hazard? Move? Yep, that's definitely one option. And it's quite a serious option, obviously. What else could we do, though? If, if you had a lot of people and you couldn't move them, what could we potentially do? Hands up all my engineers. I know you're there. The one's like, what could we do in terms of engineering to perhaps affect our lakes? Build a dam, absolutely. If our moraine dam isn't particularly stable, 
We could build a better one, absolutely. <laughs> what else could we potentially do? Boats aren't an answer. <laughs> yeah. Can you drain the lake? We could drain the lake. If the problem that there's water is there, then we could actually try and siphon some of it out or keep it at a reasonable level that would keep it. Absolutely, they're great answers. Okay. So first of all, we can just strengthen the dam itself or we can try and pump some of that water out. Things like an alarm system, they had four minutes in Juarez. That could have been enough time to move to higher ground for some people at least. Um, definitely in the, the Himalayas where they're going much, much further, we could do that. Um, other things are things like moving or controls on where people can live. And that's something where as we study the hazard and know more about it, we can do that more accurately. Okay? Sounds like good ideas, right? So, Juarez. So it got wiped out. They rebuilt it. Okay? There are now 120,000 people living in this city. And it's exactly where it was before. And it's just by all of those that, that lake before, okay? And so here's our lake, okay? What can you see on there that has been done, okay? The risk hasn't gone away. We still have melting ice. We still have a lake up in the mountains. But you can see that we have made some changes, most definitely, okay? So what changes have we done, okay? Have a look at your images. What do you think we have done? Any more answers? And that's most of them. OK. So let's take a look. So 50% of people were right. It is actually A and B. OK. You can see that we've built a dam. Down here you can see a bit of it. And it's also letting out some of the water. So we're both controlling the lake level. We're reducing the lake level. But we're building a dam as well. OK. And what that's done is it's meant that we now have a nice stable water supply as well. And so it's made it safer, but it also has provided a natural resource. But just a little warning for anyone that's thinking of moving here. It's probably not the best idea because here is, and you can look at this in Google Maps as well. It's really fun. So here's Juarez. Here is the lake that caused the original disaster. The water came down here and hit the, the city here. But look at all of the other lakes that we have. OK, so OK, we've fixed one. But look at all of these other lakes. So perhaps these would flow out the other direction. But there's this one, there's this one, there's this one. So it's not just this one lake here. We actually have to be monitoring an awful lot of these. And obviously, that gets really expensive. OK, but we're not going to be moving cities of 120,000 people. So we need to actually think about that. And it is really expensive. OK, and lastly, because it's really cool, um, here is uh, the biggest ever outflow uh, lake sort of burst, OK? So there's the Pacific. There's Washington, Seattle. You can see that we had this big lake called Glacial Lake Missoula. And it formed as the, at the end of the Ice Age as that lake, sort of, uh, as the ice sheet retreated northwards. And in particular, you can see that marked on there is an ice dam. And that one ice dam was hundreds of meters high, and it was holding back enormous quantities of water. Okay? And all of a sudden, one day, it just burst. And that whole lake drained into the Pacific Ocean in just two days. The floodwaters were hundreds of feet high, and it traveled at 65 miles an hour in places. And there's a really cool video there that you can watch that shows you that. OK, so that's all for today. I'll see you on Friday.